Uh, so welcome again to workshop number two. I'm Melita Ball, the founder and principal consultant for NBCA. And for those who know me, welcome. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, you can point your camera to that QR code right in that slide, and that should bring up a link to my bio. If you can't figure that out, Amanda, my co-host today, she will be putting items in chat as we're moving through. So you can grab the link there as well. So pay attention to your chat as we move through. A couple of logistics before we get started. First, we are recording this session. If you prefer not to be recorded, please uh, keep your video off. And to also to minimize distractions, please stay on mute for the presentation. We do have a fully jam-packed schedule for today. I wanted to make sure that we're sharing all the information that we possibly can with everyone today. Uh, so due to the length of that presentation, we cannot have a live Q&A. However, just like last time, we're, we're going to ask you to submit your questions real time in the chat. And Amanda will be collecting those as we're moving through. And then just like the last time, if you guys, those of you who were here at the last workshop, you will be getting an email back with an FAQ and I will be answering all the questions that have been lodged in the chat. So please feel free to ask questions as you're going through, as we're going through this presentation and we will be collecting those and, and answering all of them. So learning objectives for today. First, to understand the baseline requirements for risk management, learn how risk management fits into the overall development process. How does it connect to design control, those elements that we talked about last time? So we're going to be building on the previous design control training to see the complete picture of bringing a medical device to the market. And if you guys missed the last session, again, that QR code, the replay, you can point your camera at that replay code and you can catch the replay there. So I always like to start off talking about risk management and the FDA. Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I've read 21 CFR Part 820.30 for design controls, and it doesn't say a whole lot about risk management. It just says that you have to do it. Well, there's a very specific reason for that, and we're going to cover that today before we jump into the details. So it really doesn't say that much because the FDA uses a process they call consensus standards. And that is they scour the earth for the best standards out there. And if they find one that they are aligned with, they will add it to a consensus standards list. And when that happens, they say, okay, we don't have to write a full regulation on this because we can simply point people to the consensus standard for that particular idea. So that is true for risk management. That's why they point to ISO 14971 in the most recent release of that is 2019. And it is a part of that FDA consensus standards list. So that's how they incorporate that into their overall framework. So let's jump in. I always like to start with definitions. And this area especially has a lot of very specific definitions around all the terms that will be used in risk management. And this is a very meaty presentation. There's a lot to cover today. There's a lot of stuff that we need to talk about. So strap in and let's get started. So the first thing we want to talk about, you know, risk management is all about safety. It's all about how your device performs in the field. So the first thing we want to talk about is harm. So what is harm? Harm is the injury or damage to the health of people or damage to property or the environment. So any of those aspects can be considered harm. Hazard is the potential source of that harm. So one of the things that we'll be learning is how you'll have to identify the hazards and the hazardous situations, and then you'll be an analyzing the harm. And that's part of the risk management process. So the hazardous situation is really all of those circumstances around which people, property, or the environment interact and are exposed to one or more of the hazards. Risk. So most people think they know what risk is, but thanks to us, the standard has, has actually defined it for us. So we don't have to kind of figure out what that is. So risk is a combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. So there's two really litmus tests. The first piece is what is the most probable area of occurrence for that particular harm? And then if it were to occur, what's going to be the severity of that harm? What's what it's going to cause? Is it going to just be a minor injury? Will it be death? Will it be anything in between? Risk assessment is a section within the risk management process that covers two things. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But risk assessment is the overall process 
of risk analysis and risk evaluation. Okay, so the first piece of this is risk analysis, which is the systemic use of available information to identify hazards and to estimate that risk. So you're using all the available information that you have at your disposal, and you are then analyzing that data. Then risk estimation. It is the process used to assign values of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that later and how you actually do each one of those steps. So risk evaluation is the overall process of comparing the estimated risk and to determine the acceptability of that risk. So once you get all of these numbers, I'm kind of old school, we call it RPN number, the risk probability number is when you multiply these things out and you get to this number. Then when you're looking at that number, you have to decide whether that is within the framework of acceptability of risk or whether it's not. And then you have to define what that is for your organization. Risk controls are all the processes and pieces and parts of of how do we decide how we're going to reduce either the severity or the probability of that harm and how to maintain that within specific levels. Then after you do that process, there is this thing called residual risk. So that's what's left over when you've done all the risk reductions, all the risk controls that you can. So that's the risk that remains after the risk control. So then you we're going to evaluate that again to make sure that it is within the acceptable framework. So risk management overall, it's really important to understand that it's the overall process of applying these management policies, procedures, and practices to analyze, evaluate, control, and monitor risk. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later too. And risk management really begins at the beginning of design. And it goes all the way through the life cycle of the device up to and including decommissioning and disposal. Uh, risk management file is that set of records. It can be electronic, doesn't mean it has to be a physical file, but it's a set of records and other documents produced during the risk management process that will be live documents that you will come back to time and time again, even after you move out of design and into the production phase and the post-production phase of the life cycle of the device, you will constantly keep that risk management file up to date. Some of the things that occur in the marketplace are once you get the your device to the market, you're gonna learn things that you didn't know. You try your best in the design process to try to anticipate most of that. But the hard reality is, is that once that device gets into the world, you're going to learn more about that device and you're going to learn more about the safety. So this risk management file exists so that you can go back to that and update those risks as you become more aware of how your device is working in the market. I mentioned it just a few minutes ago, but life cycle, that is really all the phases of the life of a medical device from initial conception that the be very beginning, even before design control begins, when you uh, have the concept of this design and it moves all the way through the decommissioning and disposal. So that whole life cycle is included in risk management. There's a term that they use in ISO 14971 called state of the art. A lot of people get confused by this term, so I thought I would blow it out right here for you guys. It does not necessarily mean that it's the most technologically advanced solution. It's on the bleeding edge, cutting edge, however you, the razor's edge, however you want to say that. That's not what it means. Uh, what it really means is the technological capability at a given time regarding processes, products, and services. So it rec you can reckon it to kind of the, in the clinical world, kind of the standard of care. So it's the standard out there. You have to at least meet the state of the art in, that's in existence in today's world. And of course that changes over time and the rises and, and things like that. But it really does embody what is currently and generally accepted as good practice. That's the piece that you always have to analyze your device and your risk of your device against. Post-production, I know I mentioned it before, post-production is everything in the life cycle of the medical device after that medical device has been manufactured and released to the market. So once it gets to the, the intended user's hands and or the patient's hands, then that's when you start 
collecting data around post-production. So it includes the transportation. It can include storage. If you're storing the device in some way before it actually gets into the patient's or the user's hands. Installation, if your product is big and bulky and it has to actually be installed at the location, then all of the installation processes are also involved. When you're using the product, maintenance of the product, if it's something that can be repaired or replaced or along the way, you, you may need to bring it back in to repair it and, and replace it to the owner. Product changes, any kind of product changes that happen uh, to the device, a lot of this happens with software. So if your device has software loaded onto it, software updates and things like that are all considered part of post-production activities and things that you have to monitor. And then of course, decommissioning, kind of sunsetting of the product, and very early in design, I mentioned this in the last workshop, but you want to make sure when you're doing design that you're thinking about what is the life of my device? How long should it live in the marketplace? How long is it capable of living in the marketplace? Some things that are disposables, maybe it's a very short lifetime. You have expiration dating and everything is going to be in the market a total of a year. Other devices like large volume infusion pumps and things like that, they can live in the market for 25 or 30 years. During design, you have to make sure that you're thinking about those things and identifying what's the average life of your device. Therefore, you know when you need to start decommissioning those products off the market. So I know that was a long-winded explanation for post-production, but it gets a lot of questions. So I thought I would start there. Okay, so let's jump into the general requirements for the risk management system. So what is this risk management system that you have to put in place and why is it important? So every manufacturer must establish, implement, document, and maintain an ongoing process for identifying hazardous hazards and hazardous situations associated with a medical device, estimating and evaluating those associated risks, controlling those risks, and monitoring the effectiveness of those risk control measures. That's it. In a nutshell, that's what the risk management process is. It must be applied throughout the life cycle of the medical device. So from the beginning, at the beginning of design, all the way through to when it's not on the market anymore. So what does it include? It includes risk analysis, risk evaluation, risk control, and production and post-production activities, which we'll get into a little bit later. So it seems, I'm trying to break this down for you because when we get into the details of some of these items, they can be a little bit overwhelming, but you really just need to think about it in terms of we're controlling the risk to our patients that we're trying to serve. Okay, so the first piece we wanna talk about is management responsibilities. As with everything else in this regulated environment, Management does play a giant portion or a giant role in this whole process. So management responsibilities, we're going to talk about that right up front. So top management, this is actually in the standard, top management must provide evidence of its commitment to the risk management process by making sure that they provide enough adequate resources and they assign competent personnel which means you can't just go hire someone um, that doesn't have any experience in risk management at all. They have to be skilled. They have to. So when you're looking for people to run your risk management, you can either outsource this or hire it in. But the main thing is that you're looking for resumes that actually have experience in risk management and they've been trained in 14971. Okay. You must also, as top management, you must also define and document a policy for establishing the criteria for risk acceptability for your product. These policies are going to be very different if you're a class one device with very low risk or a class three device with very high risk. That risk acceptability is going to be very different for every company. So rather than trying to define it for you, they say you need to define it for yourself. And then you need to document that. Most companies today put all of their policies in their quality manual. So it's just a section in your quality manual where you'll define and document that risk management policy. You must also, as top management, must review the suitability of the risk management process at planned intervals to ensure the continuing effectiveness of the risk management process. Similar in the FDA requirements, management reviews, you have to review the entire quality management system at regular intervals. So the language here is really similar to what you will also find just in the general practice of your risk management process, of your quality management process. So one of the things that we 
recommend that you do is kind of build it in, build in that risk review during your management review. It's one way to kind of streamline your processes that you can actually build similar items in at the same time and get both of them done. You must also document any decisions and actions that come out of those risk reviews. So if you're evaluating risk and you've seen stuff in the marketplace that you haven't accounted for as a hazard or a hazardous situation in your risk management documentation, this is the time that you go and create actions to have folks go and look at that and your risk management folks can, can have meetings they can produce a design FMEA or a software FMEA or even a process FMEA, depending on what you're looking at in terms of risk. And FMEAs are the primary mechanism, if you will, for designing that risk management process because it has all of the pieces and parts that you need to be maintained. And it's all kind of in one sheet and looks and it is easy to review. So again, this review may be part of the quality management system review, which is great news for everybody. So it's one less thing. You just have to make sure that during those management review meetings, you're also discussing risk. Competence of personnel. Now, this is a big one. Um, again, I can't stress it enough, especially for the risk management process. This is a skill set. This is a learned item, and it takes a lot of skill and a lot of training to be able to do this correctly. Uh, so persons performing risk management must be competent based on education, training, skills, and experience appropriate to those tasks. So they have to know what an RPN is. They have to know what a FMEA is. They have to know how to use them. They have to know what risk numbers mean and how to make those calculations correctly. Otherwise, it is so important that you get that right. If you don't get it right, then you could be compromising the safety of the device in the market. So this is really tied to patient safety, and I know all of us are very interested in making sure that we're not harming people by our device in the field. So the people must have knowledge and experience with the medical device itself or a similar medical device, right? If you're talking about implantables, you want to have someone that has implantable experience. If you're talking about an IVD product, you want to make sure that people are, are skilled in doing that IVD. Or maybe you have a software as a medical device or kind of software embedded in hardware. So there's all kinds of different medical devices out there. So we want to make sure that when you're bringing someone in to do risk, that they have that experience and that knowledge. And then certainly, as I've already stated, that they have to have experience with the risk management techniques and how to deploy that in compliance with 14971. Last but not least, all of that has to be documented because when you're reviewed by either auditors or inspectors in your facility, then they're going to be asking for those records of that competence. Let's start at the beginning. I know one of the very first things we talked about in the last workshop for design control is that you need to have a, have a design and development plan. You need to plan out the, all of the design and development activities. The same is true for the risk management plan. And if you remember back in that workshop, I said that there's actually three plans that you need to have to really launch or start the design and development process. The first one was the design and development plan. The second one was the risk management plan. And the third one was a regulatory plan. So you want to make sure you have your regulatory strategy. So let's talk about risk management. What's inside the risk management plan and why does it matter? So all of the risk management activities that you'll be performing must be planned. They must be sought out and figured out on a timeline. Uh, it must be part of that risk management file that we are compiling. So if you're compiling records as you're moving through the risk management process and you're getting everything in that risk management file at the end. You're also, like I said, it needs to be created in that beginning stage of that planning stage of design and development. These are not separate processes. They need to work together as part of design and development. And then the risk management plan will then be transferred into the production process so that it can live on should address all associated risk and any specific characteristics of the product. And we're gonna walk through how that works in a minute. Um, you should also consider any specific industry standards or industry performance standards like electrical safety. And by the way, commercial break here, it's a topic that we were, we're gonna cover in the next workshop, which is gonna happen in two weeks. We're gonna talk about all of those uh, performance standards may apply to your particular device. And also if the plan changes, just like the design and development plan changes, if the risk management plan changes throughout the course of development, then those changes have to be made and maintained within the risk management file as well. 
Okay, so a little commercial break here. Sign up for the next workshop. If you're interested in performance standards and product development, point your phone at the QR code that get, takes you to the registration page. You can register. Because of the time change, we are going to have a little slightly time difference um, this next time. So we are going to be at 11 o'clock Pacific and two o'clock Eastern. So if you guys are on the East Coast or the West Coast, uh, that's going to be an hour later than this particular one is today. If you miss the QR code or can't really figure it out, watch your chat. Amanda is putting the link there as well so you can sign up. All right, back to risk management. So the risk management file, what is included? The file must provide traceability for all of the risks that you've identified and what you've done with them. So it would include the risk analysis, the risk evaluation, implementation and verification of any of those risk control measures that you're going to put in place to kind of either reduce the probability or the severity or both so that you can bring that risk number down. And any evaluations of residual risk, because once you get to a residual risk, you have to then evaluate whether that's low enough. And if it's not, then you have to go back and create more controls. If that's not possible, you will move to what we call a risk benefit analysis before you can actually move forward in the process. So let's talk about the elements. What are the pieces and parts and how do you move through risk management? So this is a very kind of an eye chart out there and I apologize for that, but I wanted to bring it straight out of the standard. This actually exists in 14971 2019 so you can go grab a copy of that and you will get everything that's here. I like it because even though it's a little detailed, it kind of gives you that bird's eye view of the entire process. So you see on this side, on the left side here in the vertical line here, it says risk management plan. So the risk management plan needs to cover everything from risk analysis all the way to the bottom. Then over here, you have risk assessment, which includes two different elements, two different pieces of the puzzle that you need to put together. Risk analysis and risk evaluation are all part of that risk assessment. Then you move into risk controls, evaluation of the overall residual risk of the product itself, and then risk management reviews in post-production and production. And all of this over here includes risk management. Okay, so let's talk about risk assessment for a minute. So risk assessment is the combination of risk analysis and risk evaluation. So in that chart that we were just looking at, this is where we are. They were in that section. That is the very first piece of the puzzle after you've developed a risk management plan. So what is risk analysis? Uh, so you must perform it for each medical device and the implementation of the plan risk analysis activities must be recorded in the risk management file and then the results of that risk analysis must be recorded in the risk management file as well. So let's dive into the specifics. So you must identify and describe the medical device that's being analyzed. So a lot of times you will include the intended use statement for your device so that you get a clear picture of what you're actually analyzing for risk. Then you would identify the people and organization that carried out the risk analysis. Again, this is tying back to that confidence level. This is so critically important to your device that they want to make sure that people have the credentials. They know what they're doing in order to do this. So much so that you have to identify the people and or the organization. Say if you outsource this to a risk management company, then they want to know who actually did that risk analysis for you if you didn't do it in-house. And then the scope and the dates of when you actually perform the analysis. So that is kind of the paperwork that kind of gets identified up front. And then you have these four steps that you're going to follow. The first one is identification of intended use and reasonably foreseeable misuse. So this is where you have to go sometimes to literature, sometimes to similar devices in the market. You're doing your, your research, your analysis, and hopefully at this point, you've, ident you've got a really good intended use because that is actually tied to your regulatory pathway. It's tied to what you're going to be cleared or approved to do with that device or, or the claims you're gonna be able to make against your device. So the intended use statement is extremely important. We're not gonna cover that in depth today, but if you have specific questions about how to properly create your intended use statement, you can email me after this and we can set up a time to talk. 
identification of characteristics related to safety. This is just your laundry list of things that you know could happen in the marketplace. And this, again, you would go to research, you would find similar devices, maybe it's components of your device. You can go out and find what things have happened in the marketplace for those things. I know a lot of you are using virtual reality headsets today to make a medical device. So if you have like a virtual reality headset, something like that, that doesn't necessarily have to be specific to the device itself. You can go out and say, well, what kinds of things do people have trouble with when they wear a virtual headset? So you will identify all of those things that could potentially go wrong. So this is just a list of everything that you want to be able to analyze for risk. It also includes all the device characteristics like your surface roughness. Do you have energy sources? Do you have human contact points? Are you contacting the skin? Is it being implanted? What are those aspects of your device that you have to take into account? Number three, identify hazards and hazardous situations. This is probably the heart and soul of risk management. So each identified hazard, you must consider a reasonably foreseeable sequence or combination of events that could result in that hazardous situation. So if you have a hazard, like an electrical hazard, you can be electrocuted. Then you want to identify all those situations in which that could occur. For instance, it may take a combination of events just because there's a frayed wire in the internal body of your medical device does not necessarily mean someone's going to get electrocuted. But it may take a combination of events like the frayed wire is laying in a little spot of bodily fluid, for instance, and then the patient interacts with that and then, or the nurse or doctor interacts with that, and then they get an electrical shock. So that, that would be the situation that the hazard itself would have to be in in order for something to happen. Then once you get all of that done, then you have to do what we call risk estimation. Again, based on available da data, especially if you're doing this in the development process, you don't necessarily know everything. That's why it's called estimation. When you get to the production and post-production phase, then you're going to learn more and you're going to be able to update your risk tables appropriately. But right now, you're using available information from any kind of data, any kind of already identified hazardous situations that you can find or think about for your device. I oftentimes tell people to have make this a little bit enjoyable. Just try to think up crazy things that people could do to your with your medical device that would cause a problem. And you know, more often than not, those things actually do happen in in real life when you get your product to the market. So that's really about estimating what kind of risk you're looking at. When you get to risk evaluation, you for each identified hazardous situation, now you're going to evaluate the estimated risk and determine if that's acceptable or not. Okay, again, that risk acceptability is already defined in your policy, in your quality manual uh, for your company and for your devices that you make. If the risk is acceptable, then you can move forward. You don't need to apply risk control elements and the estimated risk is treated as residual risk. So you still need to evaluate that residual risk, but you're treating it as residual. If the risk is unacceptable, which most risks are today, uh, you must perform risk control activities. Now, this is um, kind of my favorite part is talking about how do we control these risks? Now, remember when you're controlling risk, you're controlling either, you're either trying to reduce the probability of occurrence. So you're going to try to eliminate how many times it could happen, or you're going to try to eliminate the severity of harm that it will cause if it occurs or all, both of those things, okay? So there's a thought process that's defined in 14971 that you need to follow when you're talking about risk controls. You cannot just hit the easy button. The easy button would be something like slap a warning label on it. That's really not doing anything other than just warning the person that you could get electrocuted or you could, or it has a pinch point. That's the lowest level of risk controls and should only be used if it's the last resort or in combination with other risk controls, okay? So we want to talk about first design it out. That's what we, we say, design it out or design it in and then look at labels and labeling. And that process should be from the top down. So the first thing you want to think about is, can we design this out? Can we can we make an inherently safer design or, or a manufacturing process that, that produces a product that is inherently safer in the market? That is always the best option. 
And if you've exhausted all of your possibilities there, then you then we talk about protective measures. That means we're going to design it in. Uh, the best example that I have of this is large volume infusion pumps. When somebody enters a value or when a nurse enters a value that doesn't make sense to the logic of what they're doing, it will give them an alarm. It will say, hey, here's this looks weird. Are you sure you want to do this? So design it in that somebody gets alarmed, someone gets a notification, something automatically happens to prevent bad things from happening. Uh, so that's like the second tier that you want to think about. And then last but not least, and this is this is something that you can do in addition to the first two, is make sure you have administrative controls. Make sure your labeling is, is correct, your instructions for use. You have all the warnings and all of the things that could happen listed there. You have physical labels on your product that, that warn people about problems. You can take credit for this, but the caution is don't only rely on labels and labeling. You have to do something more than that. And don't just hit the easy button because remember, this is a product that people are going to use. And if you have a hazard that could that could cause a hazardous situation that could then cause a harm, you want to make sure you're reducing those. Okay, Regardless of whether the regulations tell you to do it or not, it's just the right thing to do. Then once you've selected those risk control measures, you you have to implement those risk controls. So you have to, you know, do a change control. Maybe you have to do a design change. Maybe, you know, whatever it is that you need to do, you need to actually go implement those. And then you get to the point that you can look at what's left. After you implemented all of those changes, do you still have risk? And if the answer is yes, how big is it? Is it acceptable? And you're going to look at that residual risk and evaluate that residual risk. One thing that, that I want to stop and mention here that I don't really have a slide for is the fact that when you get to that residual risk, before you get there, you have to also evaluate your actual risk control. So if you're going to make a design change and you're going to control something by making a design change, you have to make sure that that design change in and of itself doesn't produce additional risks. <laughs> okay, remember, it's all about risk. Then we get to the risk benefit analysis. If you cannot get to an acceptable level of risk or residual risk, then you can do what's called a risk benefit analysis. A lot of times pharma companies use this risk benefit analysis all the time. What's the risk of the of the patient having a bad outcome and what's the benefit of the patient having a good outcome? And and these these risk benefit analysis are not easy to do when you do them correctly and get all the people involved that need to get involved. They can be uh, just because you have a, a leftover risk in your product does not necessarily mean that you will never get it to the market. But without the risk benefit analysis, you probably will never get it to market. So you need to have this there if the risks are still pretty high. So risks arriving from risk control. Oh, I do have a slide. I didn't know I had the slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there, once you review the effects of risk control measures, you have to make sure that those new, there's not new hazards or new hazardous situations are introduced. And the estimation of risk for previously identified hazardous situations are, are affected by that introduction. If you've already done your risk analysis, you make a design change, you change something, not only could that lead to a new hazard or a new risk, it could also lead to change some of the risk numbers of existing hazards that you've already identified. Okay, so you have to make sure that when you're going through this process, you're not just moving forward, but you're always looking back to what you currently have and asking the question, did this change anything that we've currently done? Any new or increased risk must be managed also by following the previous steps in the risk control process. So that concludes the five steps of risk control now you've come to the really important section of where you're going to evaluate the overall residual risk. So you have these individual items that are listed, and you're going to now make an analysis of how all of those risk control measures have been implemented. So now what's the residual posed by the medical device itself? So you're considering all of those things. If the overall risk is judged acceptable, residual risk will need to be disclosed uh, to the end users. Usually we use an IFU or instructions for use for that. Sometimes it's labeling, most of the times it's a user manual, something like that. The documentation that actually accompanies the device when you're shipping it. If the overall residual risk is not judged acceptable, you may consider 
implementing additional risk control measures or modifying the medical device or its intended use. A lot of times you can modify the intended use so that it doesn't, so it's not being used in those high risk environments. Uh, sometimes that's an option and sometimes it's not because it really does take away kind of the benefits. So otherwise you need to, to do something about those residual risks because the device remains unacceptable. That's where that risk benefit analysis comes in. Risk management review. Like I said before, if you remember, I said you can include this in your general quality management system reviews, which have to happen at planned intervals as well. Um, but certainly before commercial distribution, you should review the execution of the risk management plan. So this would be on design transfer, making sure that everything's ready to go before you actually commercially distribute the product. You make sure that the risk management plan has been appropriately implemented and updated throughout the development process. Any overall residual risk is acceptable or there's a risk benefit analysis to identify that. And making sure that you have the methods to collect and review information in the post-production and production phases ready to go. This oftentimes interjects the rest of your quality management system, things like complaint handling, uh, recall management, non-conformance reviews, customer feedback. There's all of those pieces and parts that should be part of your overall quality management system that can take over. So bottom line is, if you have your fully developed quality management system at this point in the game, then this part is relatively easy because you have those mechanisms already and you can just deploy them and identify them. If you don't, now it's a daunting task to kind of get all of those other elements in place, not just for risk management, but also for actually um, manufacturing your product, distributing your product, and having those feedback loops mechanisms back in so you can get the data and information you need to monitor the device in the field. The responsibility for the review needs to have not just people who, who are competent in this, but also have the appropriate th authority in the organization. Uh, so oftentimes we we talk about conflict of interest in a quality management system. So even if you're a small company and you have very limited resources, there are just a few things that you have to take into account. You can wear multiple hats, but there are certain hats you can't wear. The same person can't wear because it would be a conflict of interest. So we need to just very carefully and successfully get small companies through that. So if you're a small startup out there listening to this today or watching this today, we want to make sure that we're we're getting you off to the right start by making making sure that we're making those decisions correctly right up front. I'm going to spend a little time talking about production and post-production activities just so you guys can get a flavor. Many of you are not there yet, but remember, risk management is a life cycle process. It doesn't just end in development and, and design. So the first thing is you have to maintain a system that actively collects and reviews information in the production and post-production phases. This can be everything from incoming inspection to in-process inspection and final inspection and test on the manufacturing floor, all the way to collecting information back from the customers and, and, and taking complaints, gathering customer feedback, doing customer surveys. There's a lot of things there that you can, that you can do in this post-production phase. So Make sure that you're committing to and considering the methods for collecting and processing that information because you don't have a process to handle that and the moving through your system, then it's going to cause a lot of, of problems and issues and lost data and lost documentation in that process. So if again, if you have your quality system established, which I'd highly recommend that you do that before you're, you're ready for this phase, then you would have a complaint handling, you would have customer feedback, you're going to have tech support, you're going to have recalls, you're going to have post-market surveillance, adverse event reporting, you're going to have all of that stuff in place, which is part of your normal kind of overall quality management system. And then your job for risk management is to just make sure you're documenting and pointing to those systems that are going to collect this information post production. All right. Um, so I'll cover this a little bit. Um, one of the things that you want to focus on is, is the user of your device. So either if it's a doctor, if it's a nurse, if it's a clinician, um, or if you're, you're marketing directly to the patient themselves, it can go all the way to the, to the patient if it's an over-the-counter use kind of device. 
Um, you want to make sure that if you're manufacturing a huge piece of equipment that needs to be installed and maintained, that you're that you have maintenance logs, that you're going into the hospitals, going into the clinical sites, and maintaining that machinery uh, long term. You have to have all those plans in place, or how you're gonna uh, how you're gonna do that, and how you're gonna document that and prove that you did it. Um, information generated by the supply chain. A lot of companies now. It's not like the old days where it used to be. Um, you would have one medical device company and they would do everything. They would do everything from the initial design to fulfilling, to manufacturing everything. That's not really how the world works today. Many of these parts and pieces get outsourced to different suppliers who specialize in that one area. And if you are looking at a situation like that in supply chain, it does not reduce your responsibility for maintaining compliance and also maintaining all these risk levels. So what you do do is control the suppliers. You have to make sure that you're having that whole network of supply chain involvement. Uh, you can't just say, hey, I'm going to hire you to do the job and walk away and never and never maintain any kind of contact with that supplier. Suppliers are a huge piece of the regulatory compliance a landscape today, and they play a very, very critical role in the safety of your device long term. Um, you'll look at publicly available information. A good website to go to um, if you're in the U.S. is, is the MAL database. Um, this is where a lot of the information can be found. It's a public database. And again, if you don't know how to get there, please set up a quick call with me. I can show you how to get to it. It's free. And you can uh, do a lot of the research for free on the MAL database. Uh, and it's publicly available to everyone. You can look at information related to the generally acknowledged state of the art. Remember that term, state of the art, does not mean that you're on the on the bleeding edge of technology, but it means that what's generally available out there. A lot of times this does require research in the marketplace, maybe um, looking at some competitive data, things like that. Then after you collect all of this information, you have to look at it for relevance to the safety of your device. So once you've uh, kind of filtered that for the relevance to safety, then you look at, do we have we found other things that we didn't identify early? Did we, um, did we estimate the risk incorrectly? Is it actually doing something else in the field than we thought it was going to do? All of this can now be fed back into the risk management process or the risk management tables that you've already developed. And then you're constantly updating those. That's going to make your product safer in the field for both clinicians and the patient. Uh, but it's also a good marketing tool because if you have the best of product out there that doesn't cause problems for people, it, you have a competitive advantage. So look at this from a competitive landscape, not just from a, oh my gosh, I have to follow this because the FDA tells me to. Um, remember, we are creating products that impact everybody. We all, we are all are consumers of these products. So we want to make sure if we're manufacturing and developing those products, we want to get, get it to the marketplace in the safest possible way that we can. If the collected information is related to safety, then you would then um, go back to the risk management file. I think I covered this a little bit already. If there's residual risk that's no longer uh, acceptable, you can, uh, you can do another evaluation of the impact on that previously implemented risk control, and you may need to change them. You may need to update your IFU, or you may need to make another design change, or you may need to make a, a small engineering change or an adjustment. To, to how you're actually manufacturing that, process, um, that, that product. It could be part of the manufacturing process. That's the problem. A lot of times when we're, we're developing medical devices, remember you have developers who are highly skilled and um, uh, engineers, typically they're making the device, they're doing it one, one at a time on a lab, in a lab or on a bench. So they're very careful on how they're making that device. Once you move it into a production environment and scale up, there's a lot of things that can happen. Maybe the tolerances don't work when you apply it to uh, mass manufacturing. So there's a lot of little adjustments that you need, may need to make to the device uh, to make sure that you can not just make it in the lab or on the bench, but you can also make it in a live production environment. Again, any decisions and actions that you may coming out of this post-production activity, coming back into the, the risk management, um, needs to be recorded in the risk management file. Remember, this is a living file that continually gets updated as you learn more about your medical device. 
So I think we did really well today. There's a lot of information there. I know I know that we have quite a few uh, comments in the chat. So I will be covering all of those in, uh, in a follow-up email. So this is your last chance to kind of get your questions, throw them in the chat, make sure they're part of that FAQ. Those of you are in the last workshop, um, it's the same process. You'll get a uh, an FAQ coming back with all of the questions and answers. And I'm not just giving one sentence answers. A lot of times I'm giving very meaty, um, multiple paragraph answers so that you can really try to try to understand. If you have very specific questions that you're uncomfortable putting in the chat, um, very specific questions for your device, then book a quick call with me. You can use the um, the scan here. Uh, also, Amanda is putting the link in the in the chat. Uh, book a call with me. You can have access to my calendar. Uh, we can cover your very very specific questions, and it's all complimentary. So please um, take advantage of the of the resources um, that I'm offering for that. With that, I thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I hope this was helpful for you. I really enjoy teaching this stuff, as you can you can probably tell. Um, so please reach out to me. My email is there. Amanda is also going to put my email in in the chat. And I know most of you got here through LinkedIn, so you can also DM me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. And have a wonderful rest of your day and happy leap day and leap year. Um, thank you all.